Shawn Michaels. You may know him as the heartbreak kid, the showstopper, and one of the greatest of all time. In terms of pure wrestling ability, he is often referred to as one of the greatest in-ring performers in WWE history, and rightfully so. Mr. WrestleMania, that's his thing. But the reputation he has hasn't always been the most positive. Quite the contrary. Back in the 1990s, during his heyday, Shawn Michaels was notoriously known as one of the biggest backstage politickers and an all-around nightmare to deal with besides being a guy who would deliver the best match that night. Behind all of the success and glory we saw on screen, there was a much more darker side off screen. Let's look back at those dark days and the bright days that would come with the greatest redemption story in pro wrestling history, possibly. Believe it or not, Shawn Michaels got fired in just two weeks after he first signed with WWE the first time in 1987. He came in with Marty Jannetty from the AWA, where they tag-teamed and became champions and were billed as the Midnight Rockers, a fast-paced, fresh-faced, baby-faced tag team that was lighting up the world outside of WWE. But the very young duo's immature post-match party antics saw Michaels reportedly smash a beer bottle on his head in a silly way to impress somebody, but it just gave a bad impression and led to them getting an abrupt release. When WWE superstars in the 1980s thought that you party too hard, then maybe something's a little wrong. Yeah, eventually they made their way back to WWE a year later, dropping the Midnight Marniker and simply tightened those tassels up as they became the Rockers. Despite being fondly remembered, the Rockers never won the WWE Tag Team titles. Yeah, officially. The only time they did, it wasn't televised, and their reign has never really been recognized by WWE. The match was sort of a disaster. But that didn't stop WWE from truly treating them as an exciting mid-card act that was also featured on WrestleMania cards. The two were thick as thieves backstage and were demanding on the road. But their breakup was what eventually triggered a breakfast cereal ad? Yeah, that's right. They initially were happy at receiving $5,000 as a duo for appearing in a WWE-supported breakfast cereal commercial but were infuriated soon after when they found out that the Road Warriors got $5,000 each. What a rush. The complaint about a sugar rush to someone else, yeah. Janetti reassured Michaels that they could get a better deal with Turner Broadcasting's emerging WCW, and they were looking to possibly jump ship. They made contact only to be low blowed on that offer. Michaels was unsure about whether or not Janetti was telling the truth to his tag team partner, so he went to WWE boss Vince McMahon and discussed the possibility of having a singles superstar run away from Janetti. Things were getting complicated, and to complicate this even further, there was a lot of real life animosity between Michaels and Marty Janetti during this period with one incident in a hotel leading to a fight that Shawn Michaels wanted no part of. Roddy Piper was forced to separate the two. The police even nearly arrested Janetti before Macho Man somehow convinced the cops that it was all just to work. Oh yeah, avoiding jail time, dig it, dig it, cooler heads prevail. Michaels and Janetti both agreed to begin their journeys as single superstars, but the resentment from the failed WCW deal never fully died down. And as we've seen time and time again, real life issues make for some of the best on screen soap opera drama. Cue the classic scene, one of the best betrayals ever portrayed in WWE television history on January 11th, 1992, the descent shattered between the Rockers, culminating in Shawn Michaels super kicking Marty Jannetty on an edition of Brutus the Barber Bee Cakes, The Barbershop. No! Oh my God! 
Shawn Michaels then slamming Marty Jannetty's mulleted head through a barbershop window is an iconic instant classic scene. One that many different broken up tag teams and pairings have tried to capture, but it was never as magical as it was in 92. Shawn Michaels even admitted to taking some liberties and kicking Janetti a little harder than he needed to, leading to him getting a little bit groggy, and once he threw Janetti through the glass window, it fully cemented him as a new villain. Shawn Michaels, with a new bad boy attitude, needed the baddest girl at his side. Cue Sensational Sherry, who turned out to be a boom to his career, helping him elevate his status and really craft a pronounced character, with her experience providing some backstage protection from the veterans who weren't too kind to this new rising superstar. The timing worked out well for Shawn. It was the dawn of the new generation era, and WWE was in the process of transitioning away from a period dominated by big men to one that was more focused on athletic builds in the cruiserweight standard between 200 and 250 pounds. Bret Hart was also in the same category, and him and Michaels were bound to benefit from these circumstantial changes. It's around this time that Shawn Michaels truly became the heartbreak kid and even captured the WWE Intercontinental Championship in late 1992. But while it wasn't a new problem, substance abuse and partying very hard was something that was starting to get in the way of Shawn Michaels. WWE boss Vince McMahon put him on blast after failing a drug test, telling him that he was ruining the biggest opportunity of his career. He took it in his stride and it lit a fire under Michaels. But it wouldn't be too long before those same issues would emerge again. Oh, and those complications with his now former tag team partner continued to be complicated, yes. As Marty Jannetty was arguably going through an even tougher time, having been arrested on drug possession charges just weeks after the iconic split of the Rockers, yes. All this happening during an altercation with a security guard at a nightclub in Tampa, Florida. So, the clash between the now former Rockers had to be held off until they faced off in 1993 at the Royal Rumble. Jannetty immediately got fired after Vince McMahon heard that he was intoxicated during the match, something that Jannetty denies to this date, calling it a rumor that was spread by Shawn Michaels and who said this and who said that. It should be noted that nobody else but Jannetty accused Michaels of doing this. It took the influence of Mr. Perfect Kurt Henning to convince WWE management to rehire Jannetty despite all of these issues, and his return soon saw him defeat Shawn Michaels for the Intercontinental Championship in a rather fitting fashion with Mr. Perfect there at ringside when Jannetty beat his old partner to win the working man's title in WWE. It was quite the scene on a very early stage of a new show called Monday Night Raw. Unfortunately for Marty Jannetty, he never reached that same career high again and was only employed for another year before getting fired. Shawn Michaels would win back the Intercontinental Championship just a few weeks later. Around this time, Michaels would create a bond with several other young superstars rising up the ranks in Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, and Sean Waltman, with the four of them looking to make a backstage impact and looking out for themselves over anyone else. It was Lex Luger, the total package, who coined the term The Click, and they would become one of the most despised groups backstage in WWE at that time by everyone else backstage except them. And you're probably screaming at a screen right now, but what about Triple H? He was in the click, right? Yeah, well, he didn't come along until 1995 and quickly became the designated driver for the crew since he didn't drink or do drugs, and Kevin Nash gave him that role. So, good way to ride down the road with a party, huh? You will soon learn how much of an impact Triple H truly had on Shawn Michaels. Over the next few years, the game undoubtedly thrived thanks to his backstage partnership with them. Vince McMahon denied the click having the backstage power, crediting their collective minds rather than their force influence. They couldn't call any of the shots, but I listened, and they had some really good ideas. 
One of the more infamous incidents with Michaels outside of the ring happened in late 1995 when he was in Syracuse, New York. While Razor Ramon, Triple H, and Diesel were on a European tour, Michaels was driving with Sean Waltman and Davey Boy Smith, his opponent that night. While seemingly flirting with people at a bar, someone's ex-boyfriend was not happy about this, and he was a Marine. The bouncer sent him all out. It escalated into a fight involving Davey Boy Smith and multiple Marines, while Shawn Michaels got the worst of it with two black eyes, a torn eyelid, face lacerations, bleeding ears after his earrings were ripped out. Ouch. But as you're going to see, this was only one of many different things that got in the way of his life on screen. Despite the incidents in Syracuse, Vince McMahon still intended to go with Shawn Michaels as the company's next top star. And achieved that when Shawn Michaels began a road to redemption coming back in early 1996 to win the Royal Rumble and prove his boyhood dream true with one of the best matches of 1996 going the distance with his longtime rival, Bret the Hitman Hart, in a sold-out WrestleMania 12 Iron Man match. Pro Wrestling Illustrated readers voted this the best match of 1996. Shawn Michaels was truly having his crowning moment. He was the WWE Champion in the match that every pro wrestler wants to be in and every pro wrestler wants to win. But there's still some that say there was something wrong there. Some even say some of those attitude issues for him cause for Shawn Michaels to see that Bret Hart needs to get out of my ring. But this is deeply disputed depending on who you talk to. For those that know the issues that would come between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, maybe this is just foreshadowing of what was to come. Shortly after Shawn Michaels became the WWE Champion, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall, his road running buddies, jump ship to the competition. Yeah, they went with billionaire Ted and WCW after receiving a more lucrative offer. In a tag team match involving the three click members and Triple H at the infamous Madison Square Garden saw all of them celebrate in the ring as a group. Fans knew they were friends and they toured together, but on screen no one knew that because some of them were baby faces and some of them were heels. It caused some major issues backstage for Triple H, but not so much for Shawn Michaels because he was the top guy. As a result of this, Vince McMahon and others in WWE reportedly punished Triple H by canceling plans for him to win the King of the Ring that year and going with this other guy who was coming up the ranks. His name is, uh, oh yeah, Stone Cold Steve Austin. The hubris and pride of Shawn Michaels became even more reported in his first WWE Championship run in 1996. In-ring issues with Big Van Vader, now known as just Vader in WWE, the monstrous challenger that he would face as a fighting champion at SummerSlam 1996, became apparent, some even saying it affected their pay-per-view main event. And Vader was simply never the superstar he wanted to be after that match. There are even reports that Michaels wanted Vader fired and went off on his manager and WWE producer Jim Cornette. Fast forwarding to Survivor Series 1996, Shawn Michaels faced yet another monstrous challenger for his title in Psycho Sid at Madison Square Garden. What was notable about the match against Psycho Sid was the fact that MSG crowd was booing Shawn Michaels, despite the fact that he was supposed to be the fighting champion that everyone cheered and got behind. They got behind Sid, who embraced the support and he became the WWE Champion for the first time in his career. But it wouldn't last long, as Michaels was still a fan favorite in his hometown of San Antonio, Texas, and in 1997, at the Royal Rumble, he defeated Sid to regain the title in front of a massive crowd. And that's when those issues with Bret Hart started to come back. And the plan around this time was a main event return occasion at WrestleMania 13 in Chicago to see Bret Hart challenge Shawn Michaels for the WWE Championship with Bret Hart winning it back this time. And it's easy to see why it was labeled as a convenient excuse that Michaels lost his smile on a Thursday special edition of Raw, vacating the title citing a knee. Years later, on an a &E Biography episode, Michaels seemed to indirectly confirm that he was not exactly injured, and it was more of an addiction issue. I got accused of faking it, 
Bret Hart told everybody I was faking it. My excuse is, drug addicts lie all the time. The February 7th, 1997 issue of the Wrestling Observer with Dave Meltzer lays out even more details where he says the following, there is no doubt that there was a knee injury. Anyone who does what Michaels does is going to wind up with knee damage. Obviously, there are serious problems that were a lot more important to address than any knee problems. Just because someone appears on the surface to outsiders to lead a charmed life, in that they have money, looks, ability, and can entertain outsiders, and are admired and even worshipped by people who don't know them, doesn't mean that on the inside they are any less immune to the same problems that face each of us. Shawn Michaels would sit up WrestleMania 13, but the issues he had with Bret Hart would continue when he would return to WWE television. Shawn and Bret's rivalry got even more personal behind the scenes, and it became, yeah, very personal. Their biggest fight came soon after Michaels' return in 97, when he cut the infamous Sunny Days promo on Raw, implying on live television that Bret had some type of affair behind his then-wife's back with WWE personality Sonny. Bret Hart at the time didn't even understand what exactly happened until he got home to Canada and was asked by his legendary father, Stu Hart, and his wife if the affair was legitimate. A week later, he had a backstage brawl with Shawn Michaels. By that time, the two had to be separated, and he had a clump of HBK's heartbreaking hair in his hands. Michaels immediately went to WWE boss Vince McMahon and demanded a release, citing unsafe working conditions. Yeah, we've heard that quote floating around. Seemingly looking for a way to jump ship and join his friends Kevin Nash and Scott Hall in WCW. Or at least that was the speculation. He was not granted his release and was sent home to cool off instead. Vince Russo, who was serving as WWE's head writer in 1997, blamed Michaels for being, quote, high out of his mind when cutting that Sunny Days promo and felt it laid the unfortunate groundwork for what would develop into an issue later that year. What's even more ironic about the Sunny Days promo is that Michaels reportedly had a romantic relationship with Sunny, despite her being committed to Chris Candido, who was also wrestling for WWE at the time. A few months later, at the one-night-only event in Birmingham, England, the British Bulldog was set to defend his WWE European Championship in the main event against Michaels, dedicating the match to his sister Tracy, who was battling cancer at the time. We've seen many instances of horrible wrestling politics gone wrong, but this may be one of those cases where it went really wrong. Michaels was in the perfect position to put over the Bulldog in his home country with emotional undertones, but demanded, reportedly, that he win the match instead of Davy Boy, denying him a truly special moment in his career. To the single most infamous moment in Shawn Michaels' career. Maybe the single most infamous moment in WWE history. The Montreal Screwjob. We're not going to go over it too much. It, it is territory that has been covered quite a bit by WWE and other channels just like ours, but it's been spoken about to death. But the general idea was that Bret Hart was encouraged to jump ship to WCW. This was all documented in the infamous Wrestling with Shadows documentary, and because WWE's Vince McMahon couldn't afford to pay him a lucrative contract in these competitive times, Bret Hart was going to leave WWE. But the circumstances were weird. He was the WWE champion. He was also a Canadian hero and didn't want to have a situation that didn't make him keep being a WWE Canadian hero. His last match was going to be against Shawn Michaels in Survivor Series in Montreal, Quebec, Canada. Brett did not want to lose the title to Michaels and instead agreed to have a DQ finish at Survivor Series and he would vacate the title just one night later on Monday Night Raw. But this was WWE in a war with WCW, not wanting to repeat a situation that occurred nearly a few years earlier with Medusa leaving WWE with the WWE Women's Championship and throwing it on the trash on WCW television. McMahon and his officials were not too happy about the situation and reportedly agreed to a suggestion of, quote, bringing the business to him. And the rest, as they say, is history. Admittedly, Shawn Michaels had a smaller role in playing the bigger picture of things, but he 
who still reportedly lied to Brett's face after the match about the fact that he was in on it the whole time. Yeah, we never got that big WrestleMania rematch between Shawn and Brett. Shawn Michaels was now diving into the controversy on screen with a little bit more of that bad boy character in the early days of D-Generation X while he rode with the WWE Championship Triple H in China in tow, pushing the envelope on screen with his childish ways. And he would have to worry about some other things. That body that he had, that he was banging up, would suffer a severe spinal injury with The Undertaker at the 1998 Royal Rumble. That year's WrestleMania was going to be about Stone Cold Steve Austin, and Shawn Michaels was going to pass the torch to him while his body was simply giving up on him. Mixed reporting at the time had some people thinking that Michaels was going to try and pull a screw job of his own on Stone Cold Steve Austin. And Undertaker was apparently wrapping his fists backstage in case Michaels didn't want to do business, Taker would make sure he did. But that's also disputed. Stone Cold got his crowning moment and Shawn Michaels, with a battered back and many other outside the ring issues, was leaving WWE for the foreseeable future. We wish we could say things got better. Immediately after he retired from WWE, he still remained under contract with the company, and Triple H revealed that it had only gotten worse from there. On what should have been a triumphant night for the WWE team, with them buying WCW and everybody watching to see what down, Triple H said this, just as it's about to happen, in walks Shawn, who is just a mess. It's just embarrassing. Everybody else goes to Vince, embarrassing. He shouldn't be here. Sean comes out of that conversation, and in front of everybody in the locker room, we went at it. This damaged their friendship to the point where they stopped talking. Shawn Michaels even lost Vince McMahon's support as a result. But what really changed everything was his son. Michaels promised his wife, Rebecca, that he would clean up his act before his son was born. But unfortunately, he couldn't do it. And when his son was just two years old, he crawled over HBK's body and he woke up in a haze saying that daddy was tired, marking the true turning point in his life. Michaels turned to religion and became a born-again Christian. A year after his falling out with Triple H, he called the game to make amends and they've been friends once again ever since. On screen though, Triple H was the villain that brought Michaels out of retirement for a big return match at SummerSlam 2002. He would also go on that year to win the first Elimination Chamber match for his final world championship at Survivor Series. Shawn Michaels was back on top of the wrestling world with a clearer head and still the smile of the heartbreak kid. Michaels would continue on with an eight-year magnificent run in WWE, never once again winning a world title, but still constantly elevating younger talents and pulling off phenomenal main event matches. And this was his true redemption for HBK, who continued to prove himself as one of the greatest in-ring competitors in the world up until his retirement in 2010. His second run was relatively drama-free, only butting heads with Hulk Hogan over creative plans for that SummerSlam 2005 match. And that wasn't his fault at all beyond the ridiculous icon versus icon selling of it. It was still just, you know, Sean doing a little bit of Sean, but this still wasn't the darkest side of him. Overall, this second run featured an incredible catalog of matches, all-time classics with Shelton Benjamin, a reunion with Triple H in D-Generation X, and a WrestleMania main event against John Cena, where they actually topped it weeks later on television on Monday Night Raw. Oh, and let's not forget that classic personal grudge of a feud in 2008 with Chris Jericho. The list of classics is worth a whole video of its own. Maybe that's something we can do in the future? Even without becoming world champion, he constantly remained a staple, a reliable main event superstar you could go to, putting on banger after banger after banger before Sheamus was ever in the WWE. The pinnacle of this second run came in 2009 and 2010, consecutive WrestleMania classics against a longtime foe, 
The Undertaker. The first of which saw him fall short trying to break The Undertaker's then undefeated streak in an all-time classic. The second one seeing him seethe with obsession to seek out revenge, culminating in a fitting retirement match, career versus streak. These two WrestleMania matches, some call some of the best WrestleMania matches of all time, cemented Shawn Michaels, even in losing as Mr. WrestleMania and put to bed all those what-if questions that were floating in the air after 1998. Today, Shawn Michaels is the guy, the boss of WWE NXT, their developmental territory airing every single week on the USA Network in the United States. He joined the WWE Performance Center in 2016 as a trainer, gradually worked his way up the ladder, writing and producing television for NXT, before taking over the entire brand for WWE following Triple H's cardiac arrest in 2021. While Triple H stepping up as the head of creative for Raw and SmackDown, Sean is now the go-to guy for NXT and has been a big part of its recent renaissance in ratings growth. Given Michael's unfortunate past in his first WWE tenure, he is fully giving back and cultivating a completely new generation of WWE superstars. He's doing a damn good job at it. If you want to know what Michaels thinks about his backstage life off screen and all those issues from the 90s, this is what he said on Inside the Ropes about how he would have dealt with himself a couple of decades ago. I don't know. I don't think I'd deal with them. I'd probably suggest that we let him go. He's going to be nothing but trouble, no matter how talented he is. Either that or get him help. Honestly, that would be the biggest thing. Especially as I look at it, I think to myself, well, I, I was good at my job. He said that the first thing that should have been done to a talent like him was to try and help him before he hurts himself someday. Thankfully, there's a much better system in place today in pro wrestling as a whole that won't ever allow that type of superstar to spiral out of control like that again. What do you think of the dark side that has now become the bright side of Shawn Michaels? Let us know if you want to see similar videos like this in the comments below.